Well, welcome to QLab. This is your first day of lab, and so we'll assume that you are indeed in QLab. And the thing about QLab is there's two things that we need to work on in our lecture time. One is, like, what's the experiment about? And so some weeks we're going to concentrate on that. However, the other thing we need to f concentrate on is how to analyze an experiment. And so we have this Taylor book. It's called Error Analysis. Sounds exciting, doesn't it? But, um, in fact, error analysis is such a big thing that that is indeed why the train fell out of the window and someone did the error analysis wrong. So we want you to learn how to do error analysis correctly. And um, Taylor is very accessible. You can get the information out of it without too much trouble. Um, and so we really feel like you can read chapters one and two on your own and turn in Friday's assignment without too much trouble. What you want to be wary of is, or aware of in chapters one and two is that this is the scientific language of error analysis. There are a lot of terms and they mean something very specific and mathematical. So you can go online and pick up the vocabulary list if you want as you're going through the chapter. One would hope that you could pull out the definition of those terms. Um, language is very, very important to st statistics. So. What do we mean by statistics? Well, a good example of statistics is an election poll. So you see on the television and it says, oh, let me get a better color for this. We've got candidate A. Oops, that's not a very good candidate A and candidate B. I'll move that down a little bit so you can see. And the poll results come back and it says that candidate A is going to get 55% of the votes and that candidate B is going to get 45% of the votes. And at the, in the small print at the bottom, it always says that there is a 3% or maybe 5% or whatever the percent is, margin of error. And what they mean by that is that there's 80% confidence that the elections, if you took another election, or a, a true election that has all of the people participating, that 80% of those would come out with the same result that their poll came out with. So in effect, the candidate A may get, with 80% confidence, any score, or any percent of the votes between 52 and 58%, and candidate B may get any votes between 42 and uh, 48%, which means we have a gold star winner. We know that 80% of the elections held that candidate A is actually going to win them, and that's an important piece of information. However, we're only 80% confident that candidate A is going to win, and that's an important that's an important thing because most of us want to look at a poll and say, well, why can't we be 100% confident? So if we wanted to change this confidence to be 100% confident, well, we would have to take out the margin of error and increase it to something like 10% margin of error to, to tell the result with 100% confidence. So at 10%, well, then we'd be in a situation where we'd say that candidate A may get 45, 10% uh, margin, yeah, 45 to 65% of the vote, and candidate B may get 35 to 55% of the vote. And now we've got a situation where 45 and 55 add up to 100%, but we don't know if they're going to tie. So we really don't know the outcome of the election if we look at the 100% confidence. So the point of having a margin of error or an error bar, an uncertainty on a measurement, is that with some known confidence, you can say what the result actually means. That's an important thing. When we inflate our error bars to be 100% confident, the measurement is oftentimes useless. If we say that the, if we inflate the error bar, or the uncertainty on a measurement, that we can actually say we don't know much of anything about the election. If you say 45 to 65% of, of uh, votes are going to come in one way or another, you don't know much of anything. So uh, there's some sort of common sense involved in picking out error bar, uh, uncertainties at a reasonable level to gain information about the world around us. Okay.
So that's the reason we do this kind of analysis is because we want to pick out an appropriate error bar uh, uh, uncertainty so that we, margin of error, whatever you want to call it, we're going to pick out a uh, reasonable um, uh, uncertainty so that we learn something as meaningful as possible about the result of, of our measurements. Okay, that's topic number one. So topic number two is actually that we need to develop some good habits related to that. And the good habits that we have are things like good habits. Let's see, can you see that? I think you can see that. So good habits. When we make a measurement, we are always going to end up in a, with something that we measured. We'll call it x x measured, and x measured actually equals something that we call x best, our best estimate of the measure, measurement, plus or minus, and then we put our uncertainty on the measurement with a delta in front of it to say this is the delta of x, this is how much x changes, it's like the 3% margin of error on an election. So let's say that this number is actually 15.13, that we come out and we measure that we, the, the best value to be 15.13, and that the uncertainty on that measurement is 2.24. So here's what we're going to do when we write that measurement out, is we are going to first round delta x to one significant figure. This is very important. So we're going to be saying that 2.24 is really 2. The next thing we're going to do is we're going to um, uh, uh, round x best to the same accuracy. So what do I mean by that? I'm going to say when I quote my measurement that x measured, might have to bring this up a bit, x measured is equal to, well I have to start with the uncertainty, and I know I've chosen 2 to represent my 1 sig fig there, and that means I'm going to round the value to the same number of digits, so that if, if this is 2, then I quit at the 5. And that's the way we're going to quote our numbers in QLab, is we're going to write them in this way. So, there are a few details. Let's pretend that I have a measurement which is 15.1369 plus or minus um, 0 0.0283. I would write that by rounding, rounding here, so I'm going to say plus or minus 0 0.03. Oops need to move that over where you can see it, 0 0.03, and that means I'm going to keep two digits past the decimal point when I write that number. Um, now, as soon as I tell you a rule, we're going to break the rule, and I'm going to tell you something different. If I have 15.1369 plus or minus 0 0.01, uh, 123, that we're going to do something slightly different there. If there's a leading one, if the leading digit is one, keep two sig figs. Oops, I keep writing below the board. We'll get that all figured out eventually. So to keep two sig figs, what I'm going to do is I'm going to keep the 1 and the 2. So I'm going to write this one as plus or minus 0 0.012. And I'm going to write the leading figure with three digits after the decimal point. So that's going to be 115.137 because I have to round that six, the 9 up on there too. Okay, so that's how we want to use our air uncertainties 
to the best, um, to give us the most knowledge without extending, pretending that we actually know the uncertainty to two, three, four, five digits. Um, so we have a way of going about doing it, and then we have an exception to the rule. Um, so writing results. We're going to actually be writing some measurements in the class. And let's pretend that we start with our first measurement. Got to come back up to the top and erase here. Okay. So your first experiment is actually called E over M. And we are going to have a, an E over M that we measure. And so at some point in your lab, you'll get to the point where you've measured E over M. And you're probably going to say something like measured, measured. We'll just abbreviate there. And this pen is kind of big, so i got to change pens again. E over M measured is equal to something like uh, 15.1369 times 10 to the minus 16 coulombs plus or minus uh, 2.83 times 10 to the minus 18 coulombs. So if that's the measurements that I've gotten out of the lab where I figured this out by, you know, doing all the measurements and taking the average and finding out exactly what I think the best value is and that the uncertainty in that is, is you know, two orders of magnitude worse, then the way you will write it is you're going to say my, the value in your report, you need to write it measured equals, well, we got to round this to one digit, so that's 310 to the minus 18, but we're going to actually write this 1, 4, plus or minus 0 0.03 times 10 to the minus 16 coulombs. So here's the thing. You want to put the digits, you want to put the digits in one uh, exponential kind of scale, one, uh, 10 to the, you know, minus 16 is the units that are appropriate for this. And then over here, you're going to round that guy and um, to one sig fig. And this guy, you're going to round to match. So we've got three things going on, units and everything on the outside, and then a value plus or minus um, an uncertainty with one sig fig, or if there's a leading one, two sig figs. So why do, we, why do we worry about the one sig fig versus the two sig figs? Well, here's the short answer for that. If you have an error bar of 0.014, that error bar is 40% higher than the uncertainty of 0.01. If you have an uncertainty of 0.24, then the uncertainty there is only, um, let me see, what did I say it was? 16% uh, larger than 0.02. So the final digit matters less when you've got a leading two or three or four or five. And the and this second digit here matters quite a bit, as much as almost 50% if you've got that leading one. So for the leading one case, scientists use two, two sig figs. And for the leading other digits, just uh, round off to one sig fig. So that's the basic idea of what's going on. All right. There's only one other really big concept in Chapter uh, 2 of Taylor, and I am going to encourage you again, go read the book. It's very accessible. It's not like trying to read E&M by yourself. You'll be able to get it. It's fun. It makes sense. It's straightforward. No vector calculus or anything like that in there. Um, but it requires a lot of common sense to use it correctly and appropriately and actually make, actually make real measurements. So the concept that we should talk about, the last concept for this week, is discrepancy. 
So what do we mean? Let's pretend that we've that we're doing momentum conservation. And that we have some sort of um, things out that we've measured an initial momentum and that we've measured that initial momentum to be 1.49 plus or minus 0.03 kilogram meters per second. And that we've taken our equipment and after some collision we've measured a final momentum, final P, and the final p momentum is equal to 1.56 plus or minus 0.06 kilogram meters per second. Okay, so we've got these two momentums, and what we are hoping is that initial equals final P. How do we know if that's actually true? Statistically, we need to be able to say something about that situation. So I'm going to put a, a little graph over here, 1.4, 1.5, 1 1.6. I'll graph the first one, 1.49 is like right here, and it's got a tiny little error bar of 0.03, so it looks about like that. And um, 1.56 is about in the middle here, maybe there, and its error bar is twice as big as the other one's error bar. Something like that. So the question is, does the initial momentum equal the final momentum? Well, we've told you over and over in introductory physics that those two have to be equal, or should be equal. And now you've just gone and done the experiment, and you'd like to verify that, in fact, those are equal. It's very important. So the discrepancy between the points... is um, uh, equal to the difference between them. So we're going to say that that's 1.49 minus 1.56, and that comes out to be minus 0.07. But the whole deal about whether momentum is con conserved or not is what the error bar on that discrepancy is. If the difference is... If the difference between the two points is this, the discrepancy between them is only meaningful if it's smaller than the uncertainty. So, let's take an example. Let's take the largest discrepancy. And do this with the uncertainty on it. So we would take what is the largest discrepancy we could have. Well, the largest discrepancy... Let me mark it up here in green. Is this value minus that value? Actually, I think we did them in the other order. So what are those? That is actually 1.49 minus 0.03. This point right here. Minus this point right there. So that would be 1.49. 1.56 plus 0.06. Got to make sure you can see again. There you are. Well, instead of just doing that algebra, what I want to do is rearrange those terms and show you that I get the value that I had before, the discrepancy, 1.49 minus 1.56. And then I get the minus 0.03 plus 0.06. So these minus signs end up giving me a minus of 0.09 and the same old value we had before of 0.07. So I actually end up finding out that the largest discrepancy I can have is the sum of the value that from just taking the means plus adding those error bars together. The smallest discrepancy, I'm not doing this very well because I keep going off of the page. The smallest discrepancy, oh, uh, let's just do this all the, well, we can do it here. 
the smallest discrepancy comes from looking at the other points on there. Love all these colored pens. The smallest discrepancy is actually these two points subtracted. So I can take the 1.49 plus 0.03 and subtract 1.56, the lowest value on the other on the other uh, momentum, 0.06 minus 0.06. The same kind of algebra will allow me to factor 1.49 minus 1.56. And this time, what I find is that I've got plus 0.03 plus 0.06. In other words, the small, largest discrepancy and the smallest discrepancy give me, in fact, the same mean value of minus 0.07, but they give me the opposite additional factor that comes from the uncertainties. So what we are going to say from this, and i got to go and erase a bit to do it, is this. For momentum conservation, that discrepancy in this case is equal to 0.07 plus or minus 0.09. So we figured out what the uncertainty in the difference of these two numbers is by adding the uncertainties in each one of them up. So this is the sum of 0.03 plus 0.06. If we have a difference and we want to know what the uncertainty in that difference is, we're going to say that that is the uncertainty in the, val in the first value. Do I have that? We're going to say that it's the, the uncertainty in the first value plus the uncertainty in the second value. And that is true for uncorrelated me me measurements. And so as you go through this week, you're going to get to, to work with those concepts of when do measurements agree or when do they not agree. In your labs, you're always going to have an accepted value that you compare your measurement to. Does your measurement agree with the accepted value or disagree? So it's really important to get this down. Um, if the difference, if the difference between two numbers absolute value is less than two times the uncertainty in the difference, then you will say the two numbers agree. And usually you'll be cheering if your lab comes out that, guy, that well. If the difference between two numbers is greater than, we'll put the equal sign on the two, two times the uncertainty, is greater than two times the uncertainty, then we will say the two numbers disagree. So we have a way of actually evaluating whether, whether we have a result that agrees with theory or disagrees with theory, and therefore we can do science. So that's what we wanted to set you up with today was a way to, to do science and do it effectively. And um, that's all I have for you today. Just do your homework by Friday. And I'm looking forward to seeing you either in lab or next Monday. Take care. Bye-bye.